Wajko Hoyta, and Squest, one of the Jawa Cook B. Spalatina, Tasakwapen. I just said to you, uh, hello everybody, uh, my uh, Indian name is Wanokchin uh, in our language. It means loud voice, and I'm chief of uh, Spalatin, uh, the Sokhapan. So that's uh, who I am. Uh, I just wanted to, uh, just before I even begin, I just wanted to acknowledge, I think, the, uh, the families that were impacted by yesterday's tragedy, tragedy that happened here in uh, Ottawa. You know, uh, death is a part of life, but I just wanted to acknowledge, you know, my prayers and thoughts are with them because uh, those tragic events, when they happen, no matter in which community, they, uh, they have a real impact on us as human beings. So I just wanted to say that before I begin. I just wanted to acknowledge the, uh, the organizers, uh, specifically Dr. Schechter, for inviting me all the way over to Ottawa because it's really early in BC right now. I'm just waking up. <laughs> but I just also wanted to be clear to acknowledge the ancestors of the, uh, this land here in Ottawa and the present day descendants. And uh, more importantly, the young people uh, whose voices need to be heard and the ones we've lost in this study, the Cedar Project. And also I want to acknowledge our parents, grandparents and great grandparents who did not have a voice during the implementation of legislative genocide against our people. The, context for which uh, the Cedar Project sort of is a premise is about the impact of residential school and uh, sort of HIV vulnerability. The residential schools and those of you that are, don't know, the official policy was called to kill the Indian in the child. That is actual federal government policy that was uh, enacted uh, and had a real impact on our people in terms of the process of the residential school. And I think it's important to understand that uh, you have to understand this sort of historical legacy of the residential school and how the impact of colonization, including the forced removal of our, uh, from our lands and our connection to the spiritual connection and all those things that who we are as, uh, as indigenous people in Canada is important to understand. You have to understand that the residential school system operated from 1874 to 1991 and approximately 150,000 uh, children were removed from their families during this period of time. So it's, it's something that I think is important uh, to understand that it was, a, it was a forced assimilation process, that the actual process was done by legislation through the Indian Act, and uh, it's really had an impact on us as, uh, as individuals to the point uh, where if you don't know, the Prime Minister of this country actually apologized in June of 2008 you may have seen that on TV, you may not, but I think it's really important to understand that today uh, in Vancouver, actually this whole week, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission is meeting and all the survivors and families of survivors are meeting to go over to talk about the impact and what this actually means to, to us as, uh, as Indigenous people in, uh, in uh, Canada. And to underscore, I think you have to understand that the, uh, the sort of, the Royal Commission in the uh, 1996 on Aboriginal Peoples, it was a huge uh, commission that went out, I forget how many million dollars it cost, it's a report that is sitting on the shelves of most uh, governments across Canada, even our own governments, and it's important to know that like, one of the secrets that came out of that was the pervasive nature of sexual abuse in relation to residential school and the impact that it had on our people. So we come into sort of today uh, in the sort of the modern day era that we exist, the residential schools, you could say, well, that was done, you know, 100 and some odd years ago. It's something that uh, doesn't really sort of impact us today. But you have to understand uh, that the era of the residential school was intersected with what I call legislative genocide and policies and procedures by government, specifically the 60s scoop. You may have heard of 19, uh, from 1950 to, to 1960, there were official policies where the uh, issue of child welfare was transferred, transferred to provincial governments. And our community was called uh, there was an actual MOU signed by the federal and provincial government where children that were went into care of the province was then paid by the federal government. 
and what ensued was uh, what's called a 60 scoop. The number of children that went into care uh, rose from 5% in the 1950s to the 60s, uh, it rose to 30, 30%. And so today, as a result of that, uh, what you have, uh, there's three times as many Aboriginal children in care of the state today than there ever was during the height of the operation of the residential school. Understand that, that we're talking generationally that the number of children in care of the state and the impact the residential school had, now it's taking in place by with the uh, child welfare system. And so these are sort of what's important when we talk about these issues. When we speak of research, you know, there's, there's all kinds of sort of uh, how our people are viewed as victims of the, of the process, uh, how we in health research are sort of uh, always seen, and this is what our, always people say, they study us to death. You know, people come into our communities and look at us as, uh, as a subject to be, to be actually studied and looked at. And it's the interesting part in evidence-based research and what our elders tell us and our old people tell us is evidence-based research tells us what we already know. You know, that's the interesting part. If you think about it, we ask questions, but we already know the answers. And our elders say, why, why do this? And so I think it's really, uh, for our people to get involved in these types of projects has really been about uh, how our people have been treated in the past in terms of research. And you really have to really take into consideration the uh, nature of collaboration and partnership, partnerships, ethics, confidentiality, and interpretation of the findings and knowledge translation, because this is really an important part of the process. The research framework for the CEDAR project is really about historical trauma, loss of lands, territories, erosion of culture and resilience. And again, the residential school system that the uh, child apprehension began in 1894. And addiction is just one way that our young people deal with intergenerational impacts and effects of the residential school system. And I think this, these parts of it, the guidelines for ethical research involving Aboriginal peoples, I think the, the important part is uh, we really have to incorporate the sort of Aboriginal knowing, ways of knowing, and community jurisdiction over conduct of the research. You know, consent of leadership, support, collaboration, partnership, confidentiality, and intellectual property rights and ownership of knowledge. I mean, these are really critical sort of aspects and guidelines. You know, capacity building, accessibility of information, understandability of communication, and really the recognition and respect of the rights of biological samples that they're on loan to the researchers. They don't belong to the researchers, they belong to us as individuals, and it's really important. And the interpretation of data and contribution to discussion and dissemination of results. You may have never heard of the OCAP principles, but this is something that governs uh, research with Aboriginal people, and it really is uh, about self-determination as applied to research. And uh, it stands for ownership, control, access, and possession. And it's really the principles that when we talk about research in our communities that we uphold uh, in terms of our peoples and how we uh, conduct research, and especially with the CEDAR project in terms of the work that we're doing. Uh, one of the key elements of the CEDAR project is a functioning partnership. And uh, you can see that just the, the process is that we, we're uh, informed research, design and paradigm, we meet on a consistent basis, we have sort of project design and oversight, ensuring ethical standards are met. Uh, we identification of important analysis, uh, because when the data comes forward before it's released, we sit down and say, well, how is this going to be released? The issue of sexual abuse, as an example, was one of the critical issues. So how is that going to be released? That's going to have an impact in our communities, and how do we actually do that in an ethical type way? And we're very involved as the uh, partners in the communication and media strategies and also in the interpretation of the results and development of recommendations for programming. I could list off, uh, you know, the CEDAR partnership. You can see we've got a, quite an array of partners, uh, and each one of these, uh, you've got elders, you have uh, friendship centers, you've got uh, family service organizations, you have individual communities such as ours and other members of the Sokop Nation, you have uh, HIV AIDS uh, organizations, and uh, health society is involved in terms of uh, the actual partnership. These are the people that sit at the table when we talk about this project, and it's really important. I 
early issues in the north and why Prince George, and I'll come to a map in a minute that'll show you where uh, Prince George is. Uh, the question that was, uh, is whether there's a simmering epidemic of HIV amongst Aboriginal people in the north. And I think this was really one of the things that was talked about when we looked at the CEDAR project, is there an actual epidemic about to be sort of unleashed, if you will, not sort of in uh, Vancouver where it's uh, seen as the epicenter for HIV, but in the north, and what does it actually mean? And there was a recognition that the majority of clients <clears throat> had needle exchanges in Prince George were identified as Aboriginal. <clears throat> Excuse me. And their concerns of the uh, service organizations regarding access to rigs on reserve and the disproportionate number of First Nations. And again, the overrepresentation of Aboriginal women in sex work. And few studies offer perspectives on the experience and challenges of young people at risk the Abri as Aboriginal people. Why uh, Chase, Salmon Arm, and Enderby, uh, rural and remote vulnerability? This is where I come from. And uh, again, you'll see this on the map. Like most. When we start talking about these issues, uh, sometimes we think we see them as urban and big city issues and big cities, whether you're Kelowna, Vancouver, you know, uh, Prince George, those are considered urban sort of settings. Our communities are really small and remote. And where we're concerned really is about the issue of what's going on in our communities because we're seeing the same trends in terms of uh, gang involvement, sex work, and those kinds of issues and the lack of uh, support uh, and care for our young people especially around the issue of harm reduction. And so the CEDAR project came into our territory. This is uh, the territory that I come from. And you can see the, uh, if you know the issue of the murdered missing woman, this is uh, the highway of tears they talk, they talk about. You may have heard of the murdered missing women. Maybe you haven't heard of the murdered missing women, but there's uh, murdered missing women across Canada and they're trying to find a way to resolve it. But this is the, what's called the Highway of Tears along here, Highway 16. And then uh, Prince George, uh, where the uh, cohort there in East Vancouver, which you know of, and we're located in the interior in the small town uh, Chase, Enderby, and in this area here. And so it's just to give you an idea that uh, uh, when we talk of the study, this is the areas that we're actually covering. Again, the CEDAR project was designed to provide, uh, uh, you know, the uh, information with the necessary to lobby for increased prevention and care resources. And again, it's a longitudinal study addressing HIV, HCV vulnerability amongst young people in Vancouver, Prince George, and Chase. And there's approximately uh, 800 participants in the study. And the important areas of focus included the impact of intergenerational trauma and negative health outcomes, characteristics of resiliency from the perspective of young people surviving the streets, and HIV case management, the impact of discrimination. Again, the actual study methods. Uh, this is the cohort study. Uh, you use illicit uh, injection and non-injection drugs in uh, the cities. The enrollment, there's ongoing follow-up interviews every six months. And I think that's important. The questionnaires include sociodemographic information, HIV vulnerabilities, childhood trauma, and resiliency. And there's ongoing concurrent studies, HIV case management, qualitative study of injection initiation. Because it really is looking at what is going on with this population and how can we actually utilize the information in a way that's going to uh, be effective and useful to us. Now, it's really important uh, in the actual project itself that we really have an acknowledgement in terms of the cultural safety in the actual study. You know, an acknowledgement of historical trauma, loss of territories, erosion of culture, language, and kinship. And the paradigm is really acknowledging grief and building on strength because the grief and loss issues that our people deal with, especially our young people, are tremendous. And that uh, traditional foods, uh, you may think that a lot of our people still access traditional foods, but that is not the case. Uh, we try as much as possible to feed our, you know, the participants uh, traditional foods. I actually hunt and I provide them with moose meat and, uh, you know, things like that uh, because the young people on the streets are very impoverished. And they, they're basically couch surfing. They don't have access to traditional foods. So we try as much as possible to get these uh, to our young people. And it's a resource uh, support for food security and housing. And uh, in the offices, we really have it as a uh, police-free zone so that uh, the participants can go in there without the fear of being uh, 
you know, apprehended for something they may have done uh, in their in their search for uh, for their addiction. And these are the important parts, I think, of the evidence of the continuing, continuing legacy of the residential schools. You know, that uh, you got to think about this in this way. This is, has been ongoing for 100 plus years, and what does it actually look like in our communities today? And I think it's important uh, to really think about in that context, and how does that contribute to addictions? Because that's sort of what we're talking about here today, uh, and I think it's really important you know, we have published uh, materials uh, in 2008, talks about the historical trauma, sexual abuse, and HIV risk amongst the young people, and talked about just that whole aspect of the residential school and how it actually had an impact. And I think it's really important. And these are some of the statistics that, are, uh, that come out of the study. You know, 48% of the participants at baseline reported ever experiencing sexual abuse in our lifetime. 69% of uh, women, 31% men. And again, the average age of sex, first experience in sexual abuse was six years old. And having at least one parent who attended residential school and having been in a foster care uh, system associated with sexual abuse. And 65% have never count, had counseling to deal with the abuse. And sexual abuse was significantly associated with living on the streets with a place to sleep, suicide attempts, involvement in survival, sex work, and HIV infection. So you think about the context of the historical trauma, and you've heard of uh, the, the uh, Indian Residential School and the, what our ancestors, the sexual abuse, you know, the loss of language and culture, and those uh, displacement from the family and how that's impacted them. And now we're intergenerationally, the children today, uh, grandchildren or children are the ones that are impacted, and this is what we're seeing on the streets in terms of, uh, it's really important to understand sort of the relationship between the two. And the other part that I think is interesting is 65% have never had counseling to deal with the abuse. Uh, and I've worked in the field of addictions and helping for 30 plus years. And it's interesting because the historical trauma and when people start talking about this stuff, it is very difficult. And if you go to the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, if you went there just today, and you would hear people, uh, our elders, specifically our grandparents, talk for the first time about what happened to them. Because a lot of our people cannot speak about what happened. You know, it's really, it's, it's so horrific that the pain associated with it, uh, the emotional pain and what they, how they have to bury that, and that's where the addictions come into it, that sometimes for the first time, you'll have people uh, disclose what happened to them in these in situations. And I think it's... Uh, you have to understand the, the magnitude of what that means because the, these people today were in these systems, you know, from four years old up to 16. And they were uh, forced into a situation. And uh, you'll, uh, there's a book that's called, uh, they called me number one. It's by uh, Chief uh, Bev Sellers, actually. And she talks about her experience, and she's actually published that book. And it might be interesting for you to look it up and actually purchase it. It gives you kind of a first-hand account, and she's actually a chief today, and her mother's still alive, and she talks about her experience in the residential school. And see, this is the, the part that really people don't understand, is the elders today, uh, in terms of process, uh, when we did the study, they really uh, were horrified that uh, this was going on with the young people and it brought them to tears, and really they wanted to find a way to how do we actually resolve this, and I think it's really important. It's hard to explain this when, uh, you know, in terms of when I speak about uh, myself and I uh, talk about acknowledging the, the pain of our young people, and when I first got involved with this uh, project, you know, we were talking numbers, you know, there's statistics, and I was thinking, well, you know, in, in, in research, statistics are really important, but those stats to us are not numbers. They're our, our actual relatives. They're our people. They're our young people. They're our elders. They're our parents. They're our aunties. They're our cousins. So when we're looking at statistics, to us, it's really important to understand them as actual people because we see these people in our communities, and it's important. So these are, again, the historical trauma and its effect on our foster care. Uh, again, people that were taken into foster care, median age was four years old. And then all those factors associated with ever being in foster care. 
So you can see uh, the uh, statistics in terms of what that actually means in terms of the uh, issue of addictions. HIV, you know, Hep C, again, the historical trauma and risk for Hep C. You can see they're very, uh, you know, they're, uh, this is sort of the emerging sort of, uh, if you will, sort of the precursor to HIV is hepatitis C. And you can see that it's increasing the minimum of 10 new cases amongst the CEDAR participants. So there's a transition beginning to happen if we don't interrupt what's going on in terms of process. And again, the hep C is linked to the residential schools. And I think these are the important part of it, uh, that uh, making sense of the inter intergenerational trauma. And these are participants in the study and some of the things that they have to say. You know, they talked about the residential school, but they didn't really know in terms of how it took an effect on them and what it did to their lives, and they can't understand why. And uh, really struggling to break the cycle of trauma and family disconnection because the issue, that is the issue for a lot of the young participants is how are they actually going to break that cycle? And so how can we help them with that process? So you guys say elephant in the room, we say moose in the room. <laughs> this is what we hunt. Now this is a real big issue in, our, in Indian country is uh, child welfare and sexual abuse. And really because you can see the statistics that we've got to start to deal with this in terms of the issue of perpetrators and victims in terms of how we deal with this issue if we're ever going to deal with the issue of addictions. See, these are really important in terms of the intergenerational legacy, uh, young people coming of age when uh, families are healing from traumatic experiences. And I think we have uh, really, uh, our people have reacted to the HIV thing in terms of stigma, embarrassment, and we've actually have not done a good job of actually dealing with these issues in our communities because we have a very difficult time in terms of even talking about harm reduction as a, as a method from which to deal with addictions. Our challenges, again, really is supporting our young people and uh, how do we actually get our young people uh, that use uh, drugs because they're in pain and how do we actually provide cultural uh, services to them because there's in our in our traditions, you can't access some services because of uh, if you're actually actively using. And so these are some of the things we're having to address. And I think the, it's really important to acknowledge the complex impacts and layers of historical trauma amongst our young people, but also uh, it's really important to, uh, for healing to take place is access to ceremony, healing traditional land, foods, and languages. And I guess the, the most important part is that we heard in uh, situations and uh, when we were doing a uh, learning potlatch in Prince George, young people standing up and saying that uh, even though they were in the study, they were able to heal, be parents, find work, and stay connected to the community even though they were, quote, addicted. And I think it's really important to understand the resiliency of our people in that way. I think it's really important. And again, reducing harm in our community and we have to strategize on better ways to uh, work together. Uh, because the bottom line is how do we invest more in prevention and invest in the children now rather than waiting for down the road. Uh, the cost, I think you heard about, you'll hear about costs in terms of the billions of what this costs, the healthcare system and what it costs society. And I think we're talking about we have to invest more on the ground and prevention. So uh, thank you very much. <laughs>